I guess we should start. Um, so this is the very last lecture of the class, sadly. Um, but we're going to end in a terrible place, which is the sorry state of computer security. And uh, my goal is to make you all, if not paranoid, then at least aware of your own footprint when it comes to security and privacy. Um, the world, as the first line says, the world is a scary place, and everyone is out to get you. Uh, it's not paranoia if they're actually coming after you. Remember that always. No, it's not actually that bad. Um, in general, the first thing you should do when trying to figure out what to do about security and privacy in your life is to figure out what trade-off is worth it for you. Like, figure out what your threat model is, because that is the only thing that matters in terms of figuring out what is worth doing and what is not worth doing. Generally, um, you're going to be paying for security, uh, whether that's in terms of um, usability, uh, flexibility, the ability to recover when things fail, um, it might even be in terms of like monetary value, uh, you will be paying for it in one way or another. And there's gonna come a point where you have to balance these. You have to figure out how much am I willing to pay in terms of my own time, in terms of usability, uh, compared to the security that buys me. For example, if, you, if your threat model is like, someone steals your laptop while it's off, that's pretty easy to defend against, and you don't have to do all that much to protect against it. If your threat model is like the NSA or Mossad, then you have a problem. Like, this is gonna be very ex expensive to be defending against. It might not even be possible. Um, the other thing to be aware of is that security is an ongoing process. If you configured your computer to be secure 10 years ago, it will no longer be secure today. And so you actually need to stay updated on these security topics. And that is why the very first thing in, this, in, this, uh, in the lecture notes is a list of people that it's worthwhile to follow if you are interested in security. So these people are uh, various kinds of people interested or working on or researching security. Um, these, these are the Twitter profiles. Many of them have websites as well uh, or blogs and those kinds of things. Following them uh, is something I recommend because they will often just keep you apprised of the things that are happening in the security world. Um, Troy Hunt was listed at the top there. Um, also has a website called Have I Been Pawned? Um, which is basically a giant database of all the data breaches that are happening in both emails and passwords um, that lets you basically get an email alert whenever your email appears in any of the like breaches that happen on the web. Um, Moxie at the bottom of the list is one of the inventors of Signal, which is something we'll come back to. Um, there's a lot of these people I, I recommend following them highly. Um, first, some like general security advice. Um, there are a lot of good articles and there are a lot of really bad articles out there on how to do security and how not to do security. Um, I've listened to a, a write-up by Tech Solidarity that's pretty good that's on sort of the do's and don'ts for journalists online. And if it's secure for journalists, it will probably work well for you as well uh, because you are probably less of a target than journalists are. Um, there's also some really good travel and security advice there. I'll get back to some of it um, later on in, uh, in the lecture. Um, but I recommend that you read through these just to put you in the right mindset of what kind of security issues you have to keep in mind and what is bad security advice. Um, one thing I will say that comes up in some of these is do not trust USB cables. If you ever plug your device like your phone or your laptop or anything into like a USB socket, there, it's a terrible idea. Um, takeovers over USB are surprisingly simple. You should buy one of these things. This is a USB data block. You plug, it's just a USB plug on both sides. You plug it in, you plug your cable in here, and now you're fine, because the only pins that it lets through are the power pins. So nothing else can exploit your device with these. They're handy to use, they're super cheap. Uh, it's worthwhile to get one if you travel a lot. The first thing we're gonna talk about is um, authentication. So very often, whether you're on the web or in person or whatever, usually on the web, you're going to have to authenticate one way or another. And the very first step to like massively improve your security is to get a password manager if you don't already have one. You should not be making up your own passwords, you should not be remembering your passwords, and you should certainly not be writing down your password, pa passwords. passwords. Um, so there are lots of password managers out there, some are good, some are bad. Uh, one password or the Linux standard password manager pass are both really good options. Um, one password is a lot easier to use across many devices. Um, because it's sort of built to do sync and all of that. Pass is very simple and straightforward and works with Git and, uh, and encrypted files, uh, but also works easily well. Uh, you should use these applications to generate passwords for all of the sites that you care about, and you should probably change all those passwords today if you have not been using one so far. If there's any service you can log into that you care about where you know the password in your head, that is a problem, and you should fix that. Um, 
There's, so the, I mentioned how I've been pawned. There's also a website called, uh, has my password been pawned? Yeah. I, I, yeah. Um, which is a similar website to the other one where you can type in your password and it will tell you whether that password has appeared in any of the data breaches over like the past few years. Uh, chances are that it has. Certainly if that website says yes, you should definitely change your password. Um, but even if it doesn't, like use a generated password, use one that's like 32 characters long or something, there's no reason for you to be remembering your password anymore. Um, the second thing you can do that also massively improves, improves your security is to enable two-factor authentication. Um, Two-factor authentication is basically the idea that in addition to logging in with your password, you have to provide some other thing. Usually, um, the way to think about this is something you know and something you have. So your password is something you know, and your second factor authentication is something you have, like a phone or a USB dongle or something like that. There are a lot of schemes for this. The most common one you see is uh, SMS authentication, where they will send you an SMS message with like some kind of text code. Um, that works in a pinch, but it's a terrible security mechanism. Um, it turns out that these kind of uh, mechanisms are really easy to subvert if someone actually wanted to attack you. Um, mobile device-based things like um, basically Google Authenticator, Duo, many of these kinds of things that where you have an app or a little device that gives you a code. All of those things are better than SMS, but they're still not great because they're still vulnerable to what's known as phishing attacks. So a phishing attack is basically, uh, many of you may know this already, uh, there is like a real website that's like your bank, uh, and then someone sets up another website that looks just like your bank, uh, but actually it's not your bank. It's actually a, a malicious attacker. And somehow they make you visit this page. And you think you're on your bank website, you input like your login credentials and whatnot, and behind the scenes the attacker just sends those login credentials to the real bank, um, and now they're logged in as you. If you add a two-factor authentication mechanism that uses some kind of code, then the attacker can do the exact same attack, right? They show you this bank website, you put in your username and password, they send it to the bank, the bank says, we sent you an SMS message, right? This website tells you, I sent you an SMS message. You get a code, it's actually from your bank, you put that code into this website, the attacker puts it to the bank, and now they're logged in as you. So these, these mechanisms do not provide any sort of serious defense against phishing attacks. Um, what you really want is something called uh, U2F or FIDO. Um, this is a relatively new uh, two-factor authentication standard that basically is sort of the, the best in term, the best practices we know of in terms of how to use a two-factor authentication scheme correctly. It will protect against phishing attacks like this. Um, it's basically a little dongle like this. You stick it into your USB port, it has a little button on it. You stick it into your USB port when the website asks you to log in, and at that point, the button will start flashing, you press the button, and now you're logged in. Uh, it turns out this can be done extremely securely and without the website knowing anything about you, um, without it knowing anything about being able to correlate these keys. Um, if someone steals this key, they would still need your password, hence the two-factor authentication bit. Um, and it, basically what it does is, it, is that this device in my pocket does a cryptographic handshake with the web server. And in that process, is, it also checks that the web server knows some secret that it knew the first time I authenticated with it. So it, it is both the server authenticating my device and my device authenticating the web server. And so this prevents phishing attacks. Yep, also MIT ISMT gives away free YubiKeys. Yep. So there's no reason to not use one. Yep, uh, and should you want, so I, happen, I have bought one, and the reason is because I wanted one that also works with my phone. Uh, so this supports NFC, the like near field communication. So I can use it with my phone like this and therefore get uh, two-factor authentication on my phone as well. Um, and they have like 20% off for students, so they're pretty, they're pretty cheap to get. Um, uh, whenever you enable two, yeah, sorry, go ahead. Is there anything to do yet with Windows uh, Bluetooth? Uh, so in other words, the phone would authenticate your login with Bluetooth. They've been waiting for that for a long time. I don't know that you can use your phone as a second factor dongle. Yeah. Uh, I think in theory your phone could implement U2F, but they don't generally. Part of the reason you want a device like this, like you don't want a general computing device, is because with this the key can sort of be burned into the firmware of the device. So like this is not running an operating system of any like meaningful capacity. It's a tiny device with 
that's very specialized, and so it's very hard to get the key out of this. If you try to stick the key into a regular phone, like if the phone got compromised in some way, like the operating system of the phone got compromised, you may be able to get the key material. Are, are you aware of any USB dongles for the laptop that would kind of sit flush against the, the laptop that would give you the NFC reader capability that phones are giving you? In other words, could you move the, um, instead of having to insert it, and it would be nice to be able to just kind of. So you don't it. want it to always be in. No, I know that. I'm saying right. you put a generic NFC reader in a USB. You plug up a USB mm -hmm. port yep. permanently or quasi-permanently yep. with an NFC reader yep. and then be able to authenticate using that NFC capability. Um, so uh, it might be that you can get an NFC, NFC reader for your laptop and that way never have to like plug it in. You right. just like hold it underneath. Um, I don't know. Okay. Um, so usually when you set up two-factor authentication, the website will give you some kind of recovery code. There's usually some like sequence of numbers, they usually give you more than one, and they say that if you forget your second factor authentication, here are some paper codes or backup codes. Um, the reason you have these is in case you use, lose your second factor. Um, you should generally have more than one of them and like keep one in a secure place in case you lose the other, but should you for some reason not have access to your second factor, like all of them burn down in a house fire or something, um, then you want some way to recover your account. Because generally, once you turn on two-factor authentication, there's like no more recovering your account. There's no other way to get it back except by having the second factor. If the website allows you to recover your account without that, I would consider that a bug of the website. Um, so these paper codes, they're intended to actually be paper codes. They're intended to never be stored on a computer, be printed out and like put in a safe somewhere. Because you should generally never have to use them. If you have to use them, it's an exceptional case. Um, he, this is one of those cases where you get to a, a trade-off of what your threat model is like. So I actually keep my backup codes uh, in my password manager. Uh, this is a weaker form of defense because it means that if my password store gets compromised, they also get my second fa factor uh, codes. Um, and so that is a compromise that I've chosen that I'm willing to make um, because it means that if I lose my two-factor auth but I have my laptop, I can use that to get a recovery. Um, the reason I believe that this is okay is because um, in general, if someone gets my password, it's not because they've like hacked my password manager. It's because like the website has been compromised or someone is looking at the link between me and the website, like there's some kind of malware in the browser, like that's where the leak would happen, where like a password database gets compromised or someone <coughs> guesses my password. It will not be that they've like decoded my password database. It could be, but that is an attack that I'm willing to be subject to because of the convenience it gives me. But this is what I mean by set up a threat model and stick to it. Because that way you can analyze whether you're willing or not to make these kind of compromises. Um, for private communication, uh, the answer is basically use Signal. If you want to have something that gives you secure and private communication, uh, Signal is a really well-developed piece of software. Um, it is also, like the protocol has been well-vetted. It is also what is used by WhatsApp uh, for not for group chats, I think, but for one-to-one -one chats. Um, Wire is fine too if you've heard about it. Um, in general, I would say stick to one of those two. Um, there is one called Telegram that is pretty popular. Um, Telegram has a spotty track record uh, when it comes to cryptography, so I would recommend staying away from that. Um, most of these also have a desktop version, like you can install like Signal for desktop or Wire for desktop or whatnot. Uh, I would recommend that you don't do that. The reason is because your laptop is much easier to compromise than a phone. Generally, um, embedded devices or phones or uh, tablets, things that have constrained computing environments uh, are a lot more secure than your laptop is. But once you install one of these desktop messengers, they also have access to your key material um, or, or indirectly to your messages. Uh, and so if they get compromised, your host. And often the way that these services are implemented, the desktop applications, is through some like embedded browser like Electron or something like that, which also then expands the trust base you have for that software a lot. Um, so I'd recommend staying away from that. Email is uh, particularly problematic if you're doing, dealing with sensitive content. Um, I would say don't use it if you have something that's, that actually needs to be secure and private. Um, you can encrypt email. It is possible to encrypt inside email. Um, the technology works just fine. It's pretty awkward to set up. Um, it has some problems like not generally being forward secure. So if someone compromises your email later, 
sorry, your, um, uh, your key material, like your, your GPG keys or something later, they can then decrypt emails they have seen you send in the past. Um, and so th there are some of these problems. Uh, key distribution is also really hard, like learning someone else's key in the first place if you're using um, public, uh, private like, key pairs. Um, Keybase.io is a pretty good initiative to try to verify online identities and their associations with keys. So I recommend you take a look at that if you haven't heard about it before. Um, but generally, like, try to stick to Signal or, or, or to something like Wire if you actually want secure communication. Um, while we're on the topic of laptops sort of being a relatively insecure computing environment, I recommend that if you really care about security and privacy, you should get something like a Chromebook, um, which does not give you, in general at least, low level access to the hardware and the operating system. The more locked away you are from, from the underlying stuff of the, uh, the device, the more the attacker is also locked away. So like, you want something where it's harder for the attacker to attack the underlying platform. Um, file security. So file security is really hard, um, and this is a, a well-known uh, XKCD about this problem. Um, you can have the most secure encryption in the world on your file. If there's a password that you know, and the person, in addition to having the encrypted files, also has you, they can probably get the stuff if they want to. Right? All they have to do is like hit you over the head until you give them the password, and now they have the contents of your files. It costs them like five dollars. Um, and so this is another place where the threat model is really important. If all you're trying to defend against is offline attacks, like someone steals your laptop and runs away with it while it's off, um, that is pretty easy to defend against. You turn on full disk encryption, um, there's like uh, crypt setup and locks on Linux, there's um, BitLocker on Windows, and there's File Vault on Mac. Just turn it on, now your files are encrypted. Um, there's gonna be some like passphrase you need to give when you boot up, or it's tied to your user password. Um, and this works perfectly fine, but the problem is what if your laptop is on, right? If someone actually is out to get you, which is sort of the threat model space we're in, and someone like steals your laptop while it's on, or you walk away and they walk up to your laptop, right? Um, then now you have a bigger problem, or the, there's malware in your machine, because now the disk is now decrypted, and they can do whatever they want with the files. Your disk encryption does not help you at all. Um, for online attacks, you generally want to use uh, file encryption, and there are two ways you can do online file encryption. One of them is to have an encrypted volume. So an encrypted volume is basically, um, an encrypted volume is basically, that. Um, you create a file on your hard drive, of, sort of on your, file, on your regular file system. So I would have something like in my home directory, um, I would have a folder called, or sorry, a file called like secure. That's not how that is spelled. Um, a file called secure that is like 10 gigabytes large. Um, and this file is actually an encrypted file system. So I use a tool like, um, this, uh, there's a bunch of them, it's like eCryptFS or InkFS or some of the most well known for Linux. Um, you point it at this file and say, hey, this is an encrypted file. This is an encrypted file system contained within a file. And it will mount this file as a directory somewhere that you can then, like it's gonna ask you for the password, then it's gonna decrypt this encrypted volume and it's gonna let you browse the files. And then when you unmount this file again, when you like say, I no longer want these files, then this file is sort of encrypted again or it's encrypted on the fly. Uh, and now you no longer have access to the files. And so at that point you can sort of unlock a directory, if you will, whenever you need the stuff inside of it, and then lock it again when you're done. Um, that protects to some extent against online attacks, but of course, if the directory is unlocked when someone gets your laptop, you're still kind of hosed. Yep? How would you suggest backing that up? Because if you want to back it up on a cloud service, presumably it's important data you want to back it up. Mm -hmm. I mean, the whole file can sometimes change with some cryptographic algorithms. Yep. It can change in ways that are not. So in general, um, when it comes to backing up an encryption, um, it is very hard to combine incremental backups with encryption because if you, you're leaking information about the contents of your backup if you're allowing it to be incremental. Ideally, like the entire file should change no matter what you change inside of it. 
Um, so I would say that for if you if you were using something like this and yeah. wanted to do a backup of it, you would just be backing up the entire file each time. There's a there is software called Duplicacy. I don't know if I'm saying it right, but Duplicacy. Yeah, Duplicacy yeah. tries to solve that problem. So we'll we'll get to encrypted backups. Later. Okay. Um, the other approach you have, so instead of using this sort of encrypted volume, is you could have individually encrypted files. Um, so for example, the the standard Linux file, the standard Linux password manager, the one called pass, um, basically creates in your home directory, it creates a directory called dot password store. Um, and in, this is a Git repository. And inside of here, you have files for like Facebook, for example. Um, and it will be called something like dot GPG. This is an encrypted file that contains my password to Facebook. So it like generates some, some long password, encrypt it usually with, um, with some randomly generated key or with my public key in such a way that only I can read this file back later. And so now this file will basically only be decrypted when I need its contents. Apart from that, it will always stay encrypted. Now the question of course is, do I have to type my password to unlock it every time? No, I probably have like some session manager that, that remembers my password for a short amount of time. And like now you run into the issue of what if someone get, like you type the password to decrypt this file and then like moments later the attacker snatches the laptop away from you. Can they now like read the value of this password or the password for decrypting all of these files if they all share the same sort of master password? Can they extract that from the memory of the machine? And so now the question is how, what's your timeout for remembering these passwords too? But in general, storing, uh, storing files that are encrypted is just a matter of you encrypt them usually using a program like GPG. Uh, GPG has two different modes, so it can operate in uh, sort of public, private public key pair encryption mode. Uh, so asynchronous encryption, asynchronous, asymmetrical encryption. Um, or you can run it with dash C to encrypt a file just with a regular passphrase. So then we'll use symmetric encryption. Uh, and that way there are no other files involved. It's just the one file that you choose to encrypt or decrypt. Um, and then you will have to give the password every time to encrypt or decrypt it. Um, one of the reasons that people often do encryption is because they want, um, they sort of don't want other people to see their files. But sometimes you want to go even further than that. You want, like, if you're doing, you're like crossing the US border with your device, and you don't want them to know that there even is anything encrypted on it. Because if there is, they might take you aside and be like, what is this stuff? Like, give us the passphrase and like unlock it so we can see that you're not carrying like government secrets or something, right? Um, in that case, once they see that you have something encrypted, they sort of have the grounds potentially to, um, basically tell you to give them the password and have you unlock it. You might refuse, and there are all sort of legal questions around that, but they at least know that they should be asking you for a password. So some um, software tries to give you what's known as plausible deniability. So the idea of plausible deniability is that if someone looks at like the bits on your hard drive, or they like look through your file system, they won't see anything weird. Anything weird that they see can easily be explained by other things. And so they have no reason to suspect that anything is off. Plausible deniability is really hard to provide, right? If, if I have a hard drive that's like a terabyte large, and I have a partition that's 500 gigabytes, and then there's no partition for the rest of the drive, it could be that I legitimately don't have anything there, but it seems mighty suspicious, right? And so plausible deniability gets into weird legal territory as well, but in general, there are tools that try to provide this, um, usually through some kind of steganography, so they try to hide things inside of other files so you can't tell that they're there. Um, but then now you have like a JPEG that looks like a cat, but it's like 10 gigabytes large, and like, that's not right either. Um, there are also usually other costs, like lower performance, um, it's easier to lose data because smaller um, corruptions can basically damage the entire file system. Uh, there are tools that try to give this, such as Vericrypt, or which is a successor to TrueCrypt. 
Um, it tries to give you basically a, an encrypted partition on your machine that also provides plausible deniability. Um, how well it works, I'll let you decide on your own. There's a discussion that's linked there from Stack Overflow that has some pretty good reasons for why plausible deniability, even with this kind of software, is pretty hard. Yep. Probably still relevant to uh, some mafia guy who maybe threatens to hit you over the head if you don't get the password. But there was a Supreme Court ruling recently that said law enforcement cannot force you to open up your... So, so I read that as well. Um, so the, the comment for, just for audio, uh, the comment was that there was recently a Supreme Court decision that the, basically, U.S. Border Control or law enforcement in general, I think, yeah. uh, cannot require you to give over your password um, because it's basically like the, like the right to not self-incriminate, um, I think was what it was based on. Um, and this applies also to like, if you have a phone, they can't ask you to unlock it for them. Um, I would say that if you can provide, if you can ensure your security in a way that's not tied to whether they're allowed to do it or not, that is better. So it definitely comes down to your threat model again, right? If I have a system that is secure, even if they make me do something, then that is better than a, one that relies on the fact that they can't tell me to do something. But again, it comes down to whether you think your, your hypothetical attacker will coerce you or not. Um, the other thing is if you want to do encrypted backups, so your backups basically contain a lot of sensitive material, uh, there are tools that let you do this, like duplicity. You might try to like grow something yourself with like tar and rsync and gpg. Don't do it. Uh, if you want encrypted backups, there's a, there's a website and a tool called tarsnap. Uh, it has been there for a long time and there's They've really done the work to make sure that like, it gives good encrypted backups with support for incremental to the point where it's, it's okay cryptographically to do so. Um, it is a great service. I recommend you use that and don't try to make up your own thing. Uh, Are they using rsync on the back end? No. no. Uh, I, I don't actually know what Trustnap does under the hood. Um, they have a description of their protocol online, uh, but in general, they pretty much try to chunk up your backup and then do um, deduplication of the encrypted blobs. Yeah. Um, so as long as you try to cut your backup in the same place each time, those those uh, blobs will be uploaded but then be deduplicated so you don't pay for the storage. Right. So the, the optimal, for what I understand, the, op the state of the art right there is duplicacy. I mean, he actually compares his algorithms to all the competition out there and presumably he... So, he, so um, I don't actually know how it's pronounced, duplicacy? I'm not sure. Well, that was probably this duplicati, which was yeah. the first attempt. And then so there are a bunch of these. He was so, criticized for using a word that's too close to the competition. Sure. Uh, so in general, um, that I, I used that tool in the past as well, yeah. uh, and it, it seems nice. Uh, I would recommend that you use Tarsnap instead. Um, okay. The, the reason for this is because um, it means that you are not rolling anything yourself. You're not relying on your own configuration anywhere. Like Dupacosi, for example, there's a bunch of configuration parameters you can set for, for example, how to encrypt the files. Uh, you should not be making those decisions. The nice thing about Dupacosi, though, is it does work with this standard cloud providers. With Tarsnap, you've got to essentially use their yep. storage if you rely on it. Oh, okay. So uh, it is true that it is, it is a little, it's attractive to be able to use whatever cloud provider you want. With encrypted backup, it should not matter because your backup is encrypted. So it shouldn't matter what cloud you In case a, a, a provider were to go down, if you're doing it to two different cloud providers, in so, so it gets a protection. So Trustnap already does distributed backup on their backend. Oh. But to fix in the, the alternative that I use, the thing is, I, I don't remember the exact details about, but I think like the state of the art right now, if you want to roll your own solution, it's called Borg. It's pretty much does what well, does what all like Tarsnap is doing in the back end. Like, pretty similarly, it doesn't do the stupid if you have. I need something Windows only, or Windows, and Duplicacy actually is kind of in the same class as Bork. Uh, I know what you're talking about with Bork. Bork does deduplication, mm -hmm. it's actually able to work across what they call blob boundaries. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. Yeah, so uh, I guess what I would say is. Um, you can choose whatever provider you want, whatever software you use. Just um, the, the less configuration you have to do, the better. Because configuration of cryptography and any kind of scheme that involves cryptography 
you can very easily shoot yourself in the foot without realizing it. Good point. Uh, also, one thing that um, I think is important when it comes to security and backups, sort of separately from the whole encryption issue, is that you really want to think about how your backups are stored. Because, um, for example, if your backup is set up in such a way that if someone gets access to your laptop or your desktop or whatever machine you're using to back up, and from there they can delete all your backups, that is a major problem. For most software that you install today for backups, this is trivially true. If they get your, your machine, then they can either log into the service or use the UI to delete all the old backups. Or if you have something where like the last N are backed up, they just like empty the whatever folder is being backed up and then run a hundred backups of that folder and now the other things have just been run off the stack. Um, so you really want to think through what is your mechanism for dealing with a malicious person getting access to the source of your backups. Um, and that is also something that Chartsnap has a story for. And generally, the, the way that um, you do this if you were to roll your own is um, you, give your, uh, you give your machines append-only support. So they, they have cryptographic keys that can only append to the data store. They cannot remove anything. So if someone gets a hold of my laptop, all they have is the ability to create more backups. They cannot delete old ones. And then there's a separate key that you can like print out and put on paper that lets you delete backups should you need it. Um, you could also like get give the give a particular machine delete only access and have that machine like only be on every now and again to delete old backups or something like that. But you really want to think through what scheme you're using to ensure that someone can't just wipe your backups. Um, if you choose to also go on the internet, then there's a bunch of other things that are also insecure. Um, it turns out the internet is also a really scary place. Uh, there's a bunch of links in this text that I recommend you go read if you sort of look through this later um, that have really interesting descriptions of the kind of attacks that, that you can see on the web. Um, this, is not about, no, this is not web specific, but about the internet in general. First of all, open Wi-Fi networks are really scary. This is for a number of reasons. It's not just because you don't trust the underlying network, but it's because when you connect to an open Wi-Fi network, so one without encryption, um, when you later disconnect from that network and go somewhere else, your phone is constantly broadcasting the name of that network, looking for it again. And whenever it finds it, it's gonna auto-connect to it. This applies to your laptop as well. So there are devices out there. There's one called the Wi-Fi Pineapple, uh, which you can set up, you basically plug it in, and it will look for any device that's asking whether a Wi-Fi network exists and reply, yep, that's me, uh, and just give itself that name, and then the device is gonna connect to it. And there's no password, so you can trivially just pretend to be that network, and now you get lots of people just auto-connecting to this thing, and all of their traffic goes through you. This is scary. Uh, the other thing is, in general, open, open Wi-Fi networks do no encryption of the, the wireless traffic, um, and this also means that people can just sniff whatever is on, on the web, like going over the wireless signals can just trivially sniff that uh, using a laptop. So if you ever want to have some fun, go to an airport, turn on sniffing mode for your Wi-Fi card, and just look at all the stuff that you can see. Um, a surprising amount of it is plain um, So therefore, for open Wi-Fi networks, if you do have to connect to them, make sure you delete them from your list of like known Wi-Fi networks afterwards, so your phone will not try to auto connect. Um, same for your for your laptop as well, like go through safe networks and delete anything that doesn't have a password. Um, if, you, if you're ever on a network that you don't trust, um, whether that be an open Wi-Fi network or even a network that has a key, but it's like a hotel network, an airport network, um, like a conference network, a Starbucks network, whatever, um, and you don't trust the underlying network, then a VPN may be what you want. I want to be really hesitant, or I want to, I am really hesitant about recommending um, using a VPN because you're just shifting who you trust. If you're using a VPN, that means you trust the VPN provider more than whatever your internet service provider is, right? So if you use some free VPN you found online, that means you're trusting this free company more than Starbucks. Maybe that's reasonable, or the Starbucks employees in that store for that matter. Uh, so like, maybe that's reasonable. Maybe it's not, but this is really a trade-off you have to decide of who do you trust more. Certainly, if you find like a free VPN provider, it is very, very unlikely that they are more trustworthy than like Comcast when it comes to your traffic. 
right? When it comes to handling your traffic and not storing that traffic for later, for example. Um, what you can do if you sort of trust yourself is you could set up uh, your own VPN by starting a server somewhere, whether it's like in MIT Server Park, uh, on EC2 or some other cloud provider, you could totally do that. Um, this comes back to the configuration issue of whenever there's anything that's involved in security, if you are told that you have to configure things yourself, you will probably get it wrong, unless you do a lot of research and understand the underlying program. Uh, VPN, so OpenVPN, which is one of the most common used services for this, um, it's like a server client pair, has a lot of configuration, and I don't know how good the default configuration is, um, but getting it wrong is problematic. And keep in mind, even there, you're now trusting whoever's hosting that server more than your ISP, which may or may not be what you want to do. If you do want to run this, I recommend you take a look at WireGuard, which is a new sort of, um, VPN uh, implementation that is really good, that has almost no configuration, and works exclusively with like <coughs> modern cryptographic primitives uh, and a very easy key setup. It just sort of works very easily out of the box on uh, Linux and Mac OS. Well, you need a kernel module, but. Um, there's also, if you're configuring your own servers or your own clients, um, for most servers and clients you configure, there are various settings you can change. If you do have to set these settings, there's a website called CypherList um, that has recommended secure configurations for a bunch of software. Basically, which uh, types of key exchanges and hashing mechanisms uh, the server and client should use. For example, they have a configuration for your SSH client to block uh, ciphers that are insecure, key exchanges that are insecure, uh, that kind of stuff. If you're very privacy oriented, then there's a website called privacytools.io, which gives you both a list of sort of browser extensions that we talked about earlier, it gives you um, configuration settings, programs you might want to install, it mentions like VPN providers, um, it mentions Tor, which we'll get back to in a second. Um, so that's a good resource if you just want to see what kind of tools are out there. Um, and so I mentioned Tor. Tor is a little weird because Tor, um, caters to a very particular use case, a particular threat model. Uh, it turns out the Tor is not particularly resistant to powerful global attackers. Like if the government is out to get you, Tor is unlikely to really save you all that much. Um, it's pretty weak against things like traffic analysis attacks. Um, it's mostly useful for hiding traffic on the small scale and hiding who you are from the server um, or hiding the server from you, conversely. This is what onion services are. But in general, it's useful for hiding your identity from the server. But that is just about it. It is not hiding your identity from anyone else. Um, the other thing that's worthwhile to know is that even when trying to hide from the server, all Tor really does is it obscures your IP address, right? But one of the problems is that there is a lot of, um, there's a lot of sensitive material that your browser sends on every request that might make it easier to figure out who you are. So, if there's a server over here, uh, and then your machine over here, what Tor does is basically route your traffic through a bunch of intermediate nodes before it gets to the server. And so what the server sees is the source IP is just whatever this machine is. It does not see your IP address. But included in the request that you sent along here, if this is a request for a website, for example, it might include things like which fonts are installed on your machine. Well, this might be something the server can put up on their website, right? They run some JavaScript here that your browser is gonna execute, and they can send requests back. And that might like query for what fonts you have installed, might query for like your the size of your browser window, it might query for your operating system version, your exact browser version, what cookies are installed locally for that website, uh, the like, uh, the size of your caches, they might profile your browser to see how fast it can do certain tasks. And taken together, all of these things basically almost uniquely identify who you are. Like your browser will have a fingerprint that's almost unique. And so if you then later on connect through Tor to the same website through a different path, then they might still recognize that you're the same person who logged in over from over there because your browser fingerprint is, is the same. Um, Tor, the Tor project does distribute this thing called the Tor browser that tries to sort of mask as many of these signals as it can, uh, but it is not perfect. 
And so this is why Tor is only useful for guarding against very particular types of setups. Um, sort of almost like accidental snipping from the server, but that is just about it. Uh, so it is not sort of a magic bullet that solves all your issues. Um, so you want to actually access the internet and access websites, and then that makes things a lot worse than what we just talked about. So what we talked about so far was general internet traffic. The web is a pain because everything also goes to your browser. And your browser is basically an operating system that like will randomly execute whatever program the other side hands it. Um, there are a couple of ways that we talked about the, that um, Jose also talked about earlier, like plugins that could help deal with this. The first one is HTTPS Everywhere. Uh, what it does is it enables, it basically goes to the TLS or SSL enabled version of a website first, and then only if that is not available does it go to the, the non-HTTPS version. This is only a very weak defense, it only protects against very specific types of attack. Um, but in general though, you really want TLS to be enabled on everything. So TLS is the underlying security mechanism behind HTTPS. Um, you want it enabled on everything. And that is not just to encrypt your traffic, right? So it's not just, um, so let's ignore Tor for a second. I have a connection directly to the server. And like in the middle sits my ISP or my VPN provider or whatever, Starbucks, like whatever. Um, if I send information plain text over here, that includes like my usernames, my passwords, then if an attacker is sitting here and sort of observing the middle, um, then what they can do, wow, that, sure, that's an eye. Uh, if the attacker sits in the middle there, they can just observe your username and password. So that's not okay. So what TLS does, first and foremost, is it adds encryption on that connection so that anything you send and receive cannot be observed by someone in the middle, right? If all they can do is, is observe, they cannot look inside this channel. They can only see the bytes on the outside. The problem is encryption on its own is not sufficient. Because if I'm the attacker, and if I'm like someone working at the coffee shop you're at, then what I can do is I can just like, I control the access point you're talking to. So I'll just pretend to be the server, and when you connect to me, you're actually establishing a secure connection to me and then I establish a secure connection to the server, but that means that in the middle here, I get to observe everything in plain text. And so the other mechanism, and arguably one of the more important mechanisms of TLS, is that it also has these certificates that the server has to present as basically sort of a, you can think of it as a signed document that has like a stamp on it. It's a stamp, you couldn't tell. Um, that says like, I represent Google.com. And it's been stamped by someone that your browser trusts. So your browser has a list of what are known, known as certificate authorities. This is basically a list of companies that, and, and their keys, where if the server presents one of these forms that's stamped by something that's in your list, then the browser will trust that whoever sent that thing is actually Google.com, right? The attacker can no longer do this attack because I connected to Google.com, so I expect to get back a signed document for Google.com. The attacker, they can produce a document, right? They might even be able to stamp it with some stamp they made up. But when my browser gets it and checks this against the list, it does not match. And therefore, this connection, the browser can tell me this is not Google.com. And this is where you might see in your browser this like little red square that says not secure or this website is malicious or it's like trying to steal all your stuff, that is because it detected that something like this happened. It might not be an attacker, it might be the like the website administrator forgot to get their thing stamped, or it's like the stamp is expired or something like that. But in general, that's what it protect, protects against. Um, and this is one of the ways that we can start dealing with phishing attacks. Of course, um, the other thing that might happen, um, and the other thing that modern TLS implementations do, is imagine that I'm at some coffee shop and I connect to the network and I ask for Google.com and I ask for like the TLS port. I'm the attacker. I just say couldn't connect. Couldn't connect to port 443. There's nothing running on the HTTPS port. My browser is going to go, well, I better try port 80 then, regular HTTP. And your browser goes, oh, that worked. And now the attacker, of course, sees everything in plain text. They just downgraded your connection so there's no longer TLS. So the way to defeat this is 
um, included in this signed statement, the website can also say like, they can do what's known as pinning. Um, so if you have a TLS pinning turned on, then if the browser ever gets a signed statement like this that includes a pin from a website, it will refuse to connect to that website in the future unless it is over TLS. And so that way this downgrade attack will also not work. But it does assume that you have in some point in the past connected to the website with TLS. If the first time you connect to it is not, then like all bets are off. Um, and it turns out this, this protocol has evolved over many, many, many years to try to get it to this point, and it's still not perfect. There are still ways in which you can exploit the system, uh, but slowly but surely, you can get better. Um, if you are really paranoid, then you might even walk through this list of what stamps your browser trusts and sort of remove any that you don't need. By default, your machine or your browser comes with about like 200 of these pre-installed. Um, many of them have slightly shady track records. Um, and so one thing you can do is just like empty this list and then start browsing the internet. And your browser will say, none of these websites are trustworthy and just whitelist the ones that you see that you need. So that's what I do on my laptop. You should only do this if you're truly paranoid or if you just want to figure out how this works. Uh, but then you can go through and like, I need this one because Google uses that one. I need this one because GitHub uses that one. I use this one because like Twitter and Facebook use that one. But these like 197 others, they don't, or they aren't responsible for the stamps for any websites I care about. And so therefore, I'm just not gonna trust them. And now, this does mean that every now and again, if you go to like some random event booking site or like you're trying to buy a movie ticket or something, your browser is gonna say not secure and you have to go through this process and like check mark that thing again. Um, but it does mean that it severely limits the kind of attacks that can be done against you, just in terms of certificates. Um, the other extension that, that was mentioned was uh, uBlock Origin. So uBlock Origin, in addition to being an ad blocker, is actually what's known as a wide spectrum blocker. It lets you block pretty much everything. Um, it uses a technology that was originally invented for websites to say to the user, to the browser, don't allow anyone to execute JavaScript on my site. Or only allow scripts from this URL to execute JavaScript. Um, and what you can do is you can, it basically has a bunch of modes for how paranoid you want it to be. So I recommend that if you, if you just want to like be a little bit more secure, then just turn it on and everything will be fine. It'll use the, use the default block lists. Um, there's also a link here to medium mode and hard mode. If you go to medium mode, um, it will basically block all third-party JavaScript. This saves you from a bunch of attacks. Uh, it also happens to also reduce a bunch of um, uh, a bunch of ads that would otherwise and ads and tracking code that would otherwise be let through. Um, but once you enable medium or hard mode, a bunch of websites are going to stop working because they rely on some third-party JavaScript or CSS or like frames from some other site. Um, and so these modes will require you to do a little bit more engineering yourself. So for example, um, so I have hard mode turned on, and here you can see that inline scripts on websites, I don't think I can make this larger, sadly. Oh, I can, but in a relatively <laughs> unhelpful way. Um, I guess actually I can do Um, so for this URL, it's telling me that inline scripts I've disabled globally. Third party scripts, so scripts that are loaded from a domain that is not the same as this one, blocked globally. Frames from any website that is not this one, blocked globally. And then it says, I loaded, I loaded something from hacker tools like github.io, which is fine, this is the same domain. I loaded something from fonts on googleapis.com that happens to be on one of my whitelists. So that's why I allowed that. I blocked something from Google Tag Manager.com, so that's some kind of tech, like um, uh, some kind of tracking script. And I allowed an image from xkcd.com, um, and that's because I haven't disabled third-party images. Um, I can then go through and override and say, for this website, I want to allow it to load something from Google Tag Manager. I want to for this website only. I want to allow inline scripts because it happens to need it. This does mean that you have to do a bunch more stuff yourself. 
like you actually have to, like websites will not work. Flight bookings are the worst. Um, because you like go through the process and you click next and then nothing happens because you blocked the script and then you go back and then the form is clear and you have to do it all again. Um, so it's an absolute pain. Um, but it does really increase your security. So again, this is where that balance comes up. Of, are you willing to incur this cost to increase your security? Um, and so hard mode is even worse than medium mode because it blocks even more things by default. Uh, the other thing I recommend that you look into is um, uh, there's, so in Firefox it's called multi-account containers, in Chrome it's called um, like uh, Chrome profiles. Um, it's basically a way to create multiple copies of your browser that are sort of independent. Um, so cookies, state, caches, everything is just kept separated. So for example, I have one container that is for all my banking related sites. And I have one container that's for all my work related sites, one that's for all social networking, one for, the, for like uh, sensitive stuff like encrypted backups. Um, and those are all entirely separated. This means that if there's some malicious script that runs on Facebook or something, it cannot get my bank login details, cannot get my cookies for my bank, because as far as that, that version of my browser is concerned, I'm not logged into my bank. Or similarly, if I um, so most tabs are open in this extra container that has no name um, and that is just separate from everything else. So if this site, for example, tried to authenticate me through Google, it would see that I'm not logged in. But if I open a new tab and I go to google.com, you'll see that the tab, if you can see at the bottom here, has like a pink tint to it and it says personal here. So that tab is associated with the, the personal profile or the personal account. Um, and so within this tab, I am logged into Google. And I've said that whenever I open Google, I want that tab to open in this. But if this page, which is not in the personal container, tries to access, tries to check whether I'm logged into Google, it will get a no. Um, and this lets you very nicely segregate your web experiences so that it's much harder to get to this sort of cross-contamination or cross-data leaks. Um, and in Google Chrome, you can use Chrome profiles to sort of get the same thing, although I think they need to be different browser windows. I don't think they can be per tab. I'm not sure. I tried like so long ago, but I think like you kind of have like to log out or log in. Is yeah, just, like, I, I, Firefox from, is easier. From, from memory in Chrome, it's basically you choose which profile you have open. So if you switch profiles, like the window will be replaced by a window from that profile with the tabs from that profile as opposed to here where like, I can have multiple tabs open that are all in different containers. Um, that said, like Chrome is generally a more secure browser than Firefox is, sort of from a historical perspective, that has been true. Um, so, don't know which one to recommend. Uh, I've been using Firefox and been recently happy with it. Um, I think that's all I've wanted to cover when it comes to security. I think the, the, the takeaway should be figure out what kind of things you're worried about when it comes to security, and then figure out what you have to do to defend against those things. Uh, what you should definitely do though is install a password manager, make sure all your passwords are like random and generated by the password manager, and enable two-factor authentication. Um, and with that, I think we're done with hacker tools for IP. Uh, thanks for, for all of you who sort of showed up, and thanks for the people who are not here. Um, it's been fun, we will probably do this again sometime. Uh, Anish is currently compiling, or rather uh, compressing and, and transcoding all the video material. Um, so we'll have that up on the website or on YouTube as soon as we can. Uh, the initial few lectures have already been posted on Piazza. Um, so like, feel free to ask more questions there if you think of something later, uh, and sort of watch that space or the YouTube channel for um, the videos from the upcoming lectures. Or, upcoming lectures from the ones that we've already posted, which are now in the past. Uh, so yeah, thanks for coming. Hope you learned something. Thank you. Anish, I didn't record, but I had the window open. <laughs> Damn it! <laughs> Although I guess for this, there is... Talk. Yeah. That's, I didn't type anything in my camera. Mm -hmm. Except that's all. Except the cell, which is unimportant. <laughs> oh, also, if you're in
interested in security, uh, 6858 is running the semester, so you can also take 6858. And John is getting that class. Which, so which I'm <laughs> <laughs>